I'm a little excited just because so many of you are here. I am pumped up. Um, Easter is like the Super Bowl for Christians, right? I mean, this is our day. This is the day where we celebrate and we remember the power of Jesus Christ. The power of Jesus Christ to literally accomplish and do anything that you could need him to do. Amen? Amen. Well, when I was growing up, um, we were what you would call creasters. And uh, don't let that term offend you if, if it uh, identifies you. But um, a creaster is somebody that uh, doesn't know that church goes on besides Christmas and Easter, right? And um, that's, that's how we were growing up. We went, on su- we went on Easter Sunday, and then we went on whatever service was closest to Christmas. And my mom would make me wear horrible, stiff, itchy clothing, and we would go in, and I'd be bored out of my mind. And um, I hope that's not your experience today, by the way. But um, I loved the time after church growing up as a kid because as, as people that really weren't Christians, you know, for me, it was all about the bunny and it was all about the eggs and it was all about that type of stuff. And my mom always did an amazing job of laying out a scavenger hunt. And um, one year I got a 10 speed bicycle. It was a mountain bike. It was amazing. Um, five minutes after I got it, I rode it over a board with 10 nails in it. And uh, I didn't ride it again for three months, but that was a great five minutes of my life. And um, other years she would do different things, but Easter was always big. And uh, every year she would, she would get me a, a basket full of good candy, all kinds of, you know, Cadbury eggs. And uh, I hate peeps. Peeps are disgusting. If you like peeps, you, there's something wrong with you. And um, that is this horrible food. And uh, but anyway, so, I mean, just good, good stuff. And, you know, as a kid, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a chocolate lover. And my girls are the same way. They are little chocolate addicts. And I would always look for the biggest thing of chocolate to eat first. Because mom would be like, well, you can have one thing. So I'm like, all right, one thing. Uh, no problem, okay? And so my mom caught on to this. And she started doing something rather um, horrible to me. She would get me this, this bunny. And uh, this is a big old cute looking little bunny, right? And I'd get this sucker in my hands. And I'd be like, oh, man, this is like four hours worth turn some Ninja Turtles on the TV, and I'm going to go to town on this bad boy. And, uh, but then something would happen. I would take that first bite, and tragedy would strike. (laughs) Because, sorry, Rick, too. Um, (laughs) What looked so amazing on the outside was nothing but a hollow Easter bunny. And for a lot of us, your life has turned out a lot like a hollow Easter bunny. Everything looked good on the outside. Everything looked so full of hopes and and promises. And and you started pursuing these these different things, these relationships or or jobs or lifestyle or whatever it might be. And you, you bit into it. And the moment you bit into it, it just started to crumble. Life started to crumble and fall apart. You know, that's, that's the lie of Satan. This morning, we're going to be talking about April Fool's. Because this Easter just happens to fall on April Fool's Day. How many of you love April Fool's Day? I had something so fun planned today, and it didn't turn out because I messed it up. I was going to, have you guys ever seen the um, caramel onion gag? Where you take caramel apples and then you take one onion and you cover it with caramel and you have somebody bite into it? Well, my amazing wife made them and then I left them in the refrigerator too long, so they were literally bricks this morning. So unless I wanted to pay for your dentistry bills, that wasn't going to work. But April Fool's Day is a day all about deception. It's all about convincing people of one thing and then turning it on them so it's something else. It's a day for pranks and fun and doing mean stuff to other people in the name of fun. (laughs) That you can get away with it. But as I started thinking about April Fool's Day on Easter, I thought, you know what? This, Resurrection Sunday, is the greatest April Fool's ever pooled. Because Satan, for two days, was triumphing and celebrating. And he believed that he had killed his greatest adversary, the Son of God. And he celebrated and the demons celebrated and they rejoiced. And then the sun came up on Easter morning. 
And the Son of God, by his own power and glory, rose from the dead, defeating death in the grave, and overcame the power of Satan, releasing the power of God, regaining the authority of the earth, and proclaiming to the universe who he truly was. Today is April Fool's. But we don't want to be made fools of. You see, Satan's greatest desire is to make a fool of you. Satan's greatest desire is for your life to be a hollow Easter bunny. 2 Corinthians 2.14 says, Satan disguises himself as an angel of light. You see, there's a lot of things in this life that are going to look good on the outside. There's going to be a lot of choices and a lot of decisions that you have to make to follow certain paths, to make certain decisions. And when you do those things, it might look good for a moment, but it's going to be a hollow Easter bunny. John 8, says that Satan was a murderer from the beginning and does not stand in the truth because there is no truth in him. When Satan lies, he speaks out of his own character, for he is a liar and the father of lies. And some of you are sitting in here this morning and you're going, I've been lied to. I've been tricked. That thing, that person, that hope that I'd put everything into, it turned out to be hollow and it has crumbled around me. Well, in Mark chapter 10, we get a story of a young man who was living a hollow Easter bunny life and he didn't even know it. It says, as he was setting out on a journey, this is Jesus, a man ran up to him and he knelt before him and he asked, good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus said to him, why do you call me good? No one is good except God alone. You know the commandments. Do not murder. Do not commit adultery. Do not steal. Do not bear false witness. Do not steal from people or rip them off and honor your father and mother. And the man said to him, teacher, all of these things, all of the things that you just mentioned, I've done all these things from my youth. You see, this young man had come to Jesus and his hope was to justify himself. He, he believed what I call the good person lie. The good person lie goes something like this. You know what? I'm, I'm a pretty good person. I haven't killed anybody. I pay my taxes, most of them. I, uh, I don't beat my kids often. I'm pretty nice to my, my spouse. I'm, I'm a good person. I'm, I'm not dealing drugs. I'm not, you know, on a drunken spree all the time. Like, I'm, I'm a good person. So I deserve to go to heaven, right? I deserve to go to heaven. I am a good person. But that's, that's not what God's word says. You see, the good person lie is an, is an empty Easter bunny. It's a hollowed out lie from Satan that says that you can somehow in your own power and your own ability and your own might be good enough to earn your way to heaven. Now, here's the good news about heaven. You don't have to earn it. Jesus has earned it for you. He died on the cross, taking your sin, leaving them there and then rose from the dead, giving you hope of eternal life. You don't have to earn your place in heaven. But we often try to, and we often try to believe this lie, that if we are good enough people, or even better yet, if I'm better than somebody else. I mean, I'm a much better person than Ramiro. I mean, ju I'm just kidding, buddy. I'm just kidding. But isn't that what we like to tell ourselves? Well, I haven't sinned as much as Don has. And, I mean, compared to Hitler, I'm basically Mother Teresa, right? So, I mean, what's the big deal here? Well, let me share something with you. How many of you guys have ever used a piece of white poster board for a project at school? Is there, if you're a nerd like me, there's nothing better than getting that blank piece of poster board and you just start imagining all, you know what I'm talking about. You're kind of a smart little genius, I know. You're just like, man, what can I do with this poster board? This is going to be amazing. And then this is usually what happens to me. I'll get the piece of poster board and I'll drop my Sharpie on it. What do, you, what do you see on that poster board? What do you see? All you're going to see now is that black mark, right? All you're going to look at, all you're going to be able to see from this point forward is that black mark. 99.999% of the rest of this is perfectly clean and clear and usable. But because it has that one blemish, that one little spot on it, you're not going to want to use it, right? Well, you know what you're going to do? You're going to get rid of it. You're going to take it down. You're going to drop it. 
and you're going to put another one in its place, a nice, clean piece of paper with no marks. I just got a new TV, a 55-inch flat screen 4K. Yeah, baby. <laughs> and you know what? If I would have brought that bad boy home, it was cheap, by the way, too. If I would have brought that bad boy home, and there would have been a tiny little hole in the bottom left-hand corner, you know what I would have done with that? I would have taken it right back and demanded my money back or a different TV. You know why? Because when your standard is perfection, you will settle for nothing less. God's standard is perfection. So when we try to compare ourselves to God, when we try to buy into this lie that if I'm good enough, then I deserve heaven, it's never going to work because God is perfect and my perfection has to compare with his perfection and I am far from perfect. I guarantee you my life has a lot more stains than this one little mark on it. If this was my life, the one little stain would represent my goodness and the rest of this would represent my mistakes and my bad choices and my sin. And I think a lot of you can relate to that. So we can't believe the good person lie. Matthew 7 says, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. On that day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and cast out demons in your name and do many works in your name? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of lawlessness. That's a scary verse, isn't it? Because this is a good Christian person, right? They go to church every Sunday. They read their Bibles. They pray. They're serving all the time in the food pantry. They're giving up their seat to old ladies on the bus. I mean, they're doing all kinds of good works. Doing, 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 working, 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 working. And Jesus says, stop. If you're doing those things to earn your way to heaven, you've missed it. Because heaven is about knowing me. It's about relationship with me. Now, if you want to do those things after you come to know me, that's great. But don't do those things to try to know me. Because all you have to do is do the will of my Father. And you know what the will of, fa of the Father is? To trust in Jesus. To call upon his name. To ask him to save you. To ask him to forgive you. And ask him to be in your life. That's all you have to do. He will do the rest. So the story continues, and it says, so Jesus looked at this man, and he loved him. See, this is an important thing. This is an important statement to be made. Because when you love somebody, you won't let them continue to believe a lie. Right? If I love you, and I see that you're doing something that could be harmful to you, if you're, if you're mixing some chemicals or if you're doing something, it could lead to your death. Let's say you're, you're pouring some stuff in and you know that if you've grabbed the wrong thing and you could accidentally pour it in and harm yourself, I'm going to stop you from doing that. If you're driving down a road and it's completely black outside and the road's out ahead, I'm going to stop your car so you don't drive off the bridge into the river because I love you. I'm going to stop you from hurting yourself. And it says Jesus loves him so Jesus said to him you lack one thing you see you've been doing all this stuff your whole life you've been working for your salvation but now sell all that you have and give to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven and come follow me disheartened by this saying the young man went away sorrowful for he had great possessions and Jesus looked around and said to his disciples, how difficult will it be for those who have wealth to enter the kingdom of heaven? Jesus said, you've been working, you've been working, you've been working, you've been doing all this stuff, but there's one thing that you lack. You see, the one thing that you lack is the thing that you hold most valuable above all other things. What are the hollow Easter bunnies in our life that we would hold from God? What are the relationships, what are the people, what are the things, what are the jobs, what are the hopes, what are the dreams that we withhold from God? And we say, God, I will follow you, Jesus, I will give you my life, Jesus, I will live for you unless you ask me to do this. Everything else is yours, Lord, but unless you ask me to do this one thing, then I'm out. Do you have any deal breakers with Jesus? Because they're hollow Easter bunnies. They're not going to bring you life, they're not going to bring you hope. 
But this young man, because he had built his life around his stuff, because he had built his life around being wealthy and his rep and his image and the ability to do what he wanted when he wanted, because his life was built around an idol, an empty, fake, false idol, he turned away from Jesus and went away sorrowful and broken because he wasn't good enough to earn his way to heaven. But Jesus offered him a free path. Just get rid of this stuff that's holding you back and come follow me. What Jesus was saying to him, get rid of the hollow Easter bunny and I will give you something real. I will give you something substantial. It may not be as fancy on the outside. It may not have the instant gratification effects that you're looking for. But if you will follow me, I will give you something that is real, something that is long lasting, something that has substance, something that has meaning, something that has value, something that will change your life. Because this right here is only going to lead to heartache and disappointment and frustration and bitterness. That right there is going to lead to eternal life. And that's what I'm offering you. Matthew 5, 3 says, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. So many people misread this verse. And they hear, blessed are the poor, or happy are the poor. And so they think to themselves, okay, well, God wants me to be poor. That's not what this is saying. I know a lot of Christians out there that are not poor people and they're serving the Lord just fine. What he's saying here is blessed are you when you become poor in spirit, when you become bankrupt, when you begin to understand that you can't save yourself and that just being a good person isn't enough to get you to heaven, that it's all about Jesus. When you come to the end of yourself, you will come to the beginning of God. When you come to the end of your ability, you will come to the beginning of the ability of Jesus to do all things in your life. To set you free from addiction, to heal your relationships, to heal those inner wounds, to restore and renew your mind and to transform your heart. You see, change doesn't come from the outside in. Transformation comes from the inside out through the power of God. That's how it always works. In Mark 10, it continues... It says the disciples who were listening to this were amazed at his words. And Jesus said to them, again, children, how difficult is it to enter the kingdom of God? It is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich person to enter the kingdom of God. And they were exceedingly astonished and said to him, then who can be saved? Jesus looked at them and said, with man, this is impossible, but not with God. For all things are possible with God. If you've got a double-fisted, white-knuckle grip on your God, on your idol, on this hollow thing, it's going to break apart in your hands. If you're trying to cling to the things of this life, the false promises of this world, they're going to disintegrate and shatter in your hands, and you're going to be left with a mess you're going to be left with nothing. So what what do we do? God says it's impossible for you to save yourself. It's impossible for you trying to hang on to this world to hang on to me. You can't do both. You can't hang on to the world and hang on to me. But you can let go. You can let go and say, Jesus, I trust you. Jesus, I believe that you are the answer. I believe that you have a better way. I believe that you can get me what my heart truly desires, and I believe that you are a better way than I am, and Jesus, I trust you. Then all things become possible. Luke 16, 13 says, no servant can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. Now, I don't like this word money here because it's not the right word. The actual word is the word mammon. You guys ever heard of the word mammon before? Mammon is a spirit. Mammon represents a god of, from Jesus' day, the Syrian god of mammon was a spirit of wealth and worldly possessions. 
So what Jesus is saying here is that you can't both serve God and money. It's bigger than money. It's the desire, the all-out desire to hang on to and have the things of this life, the things of this world, and above all other things. That the things of this life, the promises of riches, the promises of stuff, the promises of power in this life become all-consuming to you, and that's what you pursue at the expense of a relationship with God. You can't do it. You can't be wholeheartedly going for Jesus and wholeheartedly going after this world. Matthew 16, 24 says, Then Jesus told his disciples, If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For, if, for whoever would save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. What will it profit a man if he gains the whole world and forfeits his soul? Or what shall a man give in return for his soul? For the Son of Man is going to come with his angels and the glory of his Father, and then he will pay each person according to what they have done. What have you done? What choices have you made? How many hollow Easter bunnies have shattered in your hands because they were not from God? They were your own pursuits. They were not what God had for you, and yet you hung on to them to the point where they shattered, and now you have nothing left. That is not God's will for you. That is not God's desire or purpose and plan for your life. When I was little, I had a cat named Sylvie. And Sylvie was a very gracious animal. Um, Sylvie allowed me to do torturous things to her. Um, I would tie that cat in knots. Um, one of my favorite things to do was to tie a string around her tail with a bell connected to it and watch her just go insane for a couple hours. Um, I, I lived in the middle of nowhere in southern Missouri. I didn't have a lot of other stuff going on. One of my favorite things to do with Sylvie was to create what I call a hillbilly trap. I'd get a box or a laundry basket, and I'd put a stick underneath it with a, tie, a string tied to it. And I would take, uh, I'd take little pieces of kitty treat, and I'd begin to lay them out in a line, starting underneath the box. And then about every foot or so, I'd, I'd lay another uh, kitty treat out. And then I'd call her into the room and watch her. You see, this is what Satan does with our life. He takes these little treats, he takes these things that he knows that we want above all other things, and he builds a trap, and he begins to lead us away from God. He begins to lay out these false promises, little by little, one by one, knowing that we will follow these false promises, these hollow Easter bunnies, and we will follow the trail. And Satan just sits back and laughs and watches as our lives begin to fall apart because most of you, many of you have a foundational core understanding that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, died on the cross for your sins, rose from the dead, and wants a relationship with you. You know this, but you're not doing anything with it because you're distracted. You're distracted by the things of this life. You're distracted by the things of this world because Satan has found these nice, shiny little distractions for you. And he's laid them out, and little by little, he's led you away from the things of God and into his trap. And then, at just the right moment, you're caught. Some of you are looking at me this morning with absolute understanding in your eyes because you know what it is like to be caught. You know what it is like to be held in a prison of your own making that Satan laid out all of the distractions, got you away from God, and got you into that place where he pulled the string. And now you feel trapped. You feel like you're in a cell. You feel like there is no hope for you. That's another lie. Because in Jesus Christ, the Jesus that rose from the dead, the Jesus that defeated sin in the grave, the Jesus that we celebrate this morning, he can set you free. Where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. And the Bible also says that the truth will set you free. Some of you all need some truth this morning, that Jesus loves you so much, and he didn't put you in that jail cell. 
Jesus did not lead you down that path. Jesus did not abandon you. He did not forget about you. He is not leaving you there. He's simply waiting for you to call on his name so he can get rid of the trap. But that's a choice that we have to make. You see, he's tried this same garbage on Jesus. In Matthew chapter 4, it says, Now Jesus was led by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. And after fasting 40 days and 40 nights, he was hungry. So the tempter came and said to him, If you are the Son of God, command these stones to become loaves of bread. But he answered, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. You see, Satan's going to come to you and he's going to say, If you really were a Christian, then this would have worked out for you. If you really were a Christian, you wouldn't be sick. If you really were a Christian, your marriage would be perfect. If you really were a Christian, you wouldn't have that eating disorder. If you really were a Christian, you wouldn't struggle with that addiction. So, if you really are a Christian, then just do this instead. And Jesus said, "Uh uh-uh. No, 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 no. I live by what God gives me. I'm not going to buy into your garbage. I'm not going to use what God has given me for my own benefit, for my own blessing, for my own glory. I'm going to serve the Lord. So then the devil took him to the holy city in Jerusalem, and he had him sit on the pinnacle of the temple. And he said to him, if you are the son of God, throw yourself down, for it is written, he will command his angels concerning you, and on their hands they will bear you up, unless you strike your foot against a stone. Jesus said to him, again it is written, you will not put the Lord your God to the test. I cannot tell you how many times in my life I have faced overwhelming frustration and disappointment because of the way I have tested God. You see, as Christians, we love to get just as close to the edge as possible. Just kind of like balance out here, you know. Like, man, I'm, I, have you ever been a kid in the backseat of a car with your sibling and you're like, I'm not touching you. I'm not touching you. I'm not touching you. That's, that's what we like to do, Right? We like to get as close to that sin as possible. We like to get as close to the world as possible. We like to just get there, and then we're like, but I'm still hanging on, Jesus. I'm not all the way there. I'm not all the way there. And then we fall flat on our face, and we turn around and go, why didn't you catch me? And Jesus is like, I gave you a line. Why did you cross it? Instead of standing right up against it, why didn't you stand 50 foot away so that you wouldn't get hurt? I gave you everything that I could give you aside from holding you back. And I cannot hold you back because if I hold you back from your sin, I'm taking away your free will. And then I can't love you if you don't have free will. We should not test God. And then it says the devil took him up to a very high mountain and he showed him all the kingdoms of the world in their glory. And he said to them, all of these things I will give to you if you will fall down and worship me. Jesus said, that's enough. Be gone, Satan. For it is written, you will worship the Lord your God and only him will you serve. I cannot have two masters. You see what Satan was offering Jesus was immediate gratification. Because Jesus came into this world to regain a power and authority over this world from Satan. And Satan was saying to him, Jesus, you could have it right now. You don't have to go to the cross. You don't have to be um, betrayed by your friends. You don't have to be separated from the Father. You don't have to go through the pain or the anguish. You don't even have to go through the next three years of ministry where all these people who say they love you are going to turn on you and nail you to a cross. You don't have to go through any of that. You can have it all right now. And Jesus says, you see, Satan, that's just it. All of your promises are hollow, he said to him. Because you're promising me the world, but the thing that I would be giving up is humanity. You see, if Jesus would have taken Satan up on his promise, Satan would have fulfilled it. He would have, Jesus would have immediately had power and authority over the world, but we would have all gone to hell. We are the reason Jesus came. We are the reason he lived a perfect life. We are the reason he died as a sacrifice. And we are the reason he rose from the grave. We are the reason he said no to Satan, trusting in God's word. One of the things that I often wonder about in in the story of the rich young ruler, the young man who walked away from Jesus because 
his hollow Easter bunny was more important to him than a relationship with God, is I wonder what would have happened if the young man would have said, Woo! That's not going to be easy. Jesus, that is the hardest thing anybody could have ever asked of me. I cannot even imagine how I could do that in my own strength. But you know what? I'll do it. Help me out. Help me to do it, Jesus. I, I trust you. Here it is. Here's all my wealth. Here's everything I've ever had. Here's my reputation. Here's my identity. Here's everything. Just take it, Jesus. There's a part of me that wonders if Jesus wouldn't have stepped back and said, all right, you can keep it. And you know why I wonder that? Because of Genesis 22. In Genesis 22, it says, after all of these things that God had been doing in Abraham's life, God tested Abraham. Don't lie to yourself and think that God is not going to test you from time to time. God will never tempt you with sin, but he will allow you to be tested to prove not to him, but to yourself where your allegiance is. Abraham. And Abraham said, here I am. And God said, I want you to take your son, your only son, whom you love, and go to the land of Moriah. And I want you to offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains of which I will tell you. Abraham waited a hundred years for his son. God promised him 25 years before his son was born that he would come. Now it has been many years since then. And God says to Abraham, you know that thing, that one thing that you wanted with all of your heart, with all of your soul, with everything inside of you, that one dream, that one craving that you had, which was to have a son of your own, I want you to kill him. That one son that you love. You know, that kind of reminds me of another verse. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son. That would whoever would believe in him would not perish, but have everlasting life. You see, God did not ask Abraham to do the impossible. God simply asked Abraham to do what he himself was going to do. It says, so Abraham rose early in the morning. He saddled his donkey and he took two of his young men, his servants with him and his son Isaac. And he cut the wood for the burnt offering and he arose and he went to the place of which God had told him. On the third day, Abraham lifted up his eyes and he saw the place from afar. Then Abraham said to the young men, stay here with the donkey. I and the boy will go over there and we will worship and come again to you. I want you to see a couple of things here. Number one, I don't think Abraham did this gladly. I don't think he's skipping along. I get to kill my son today. No, I don't think that's his attitude. I don't, I don't think he's happy. I think he's weeping and he's dying inside and he's wondering how God, why God, what is going on God? But he's continuing to move forward out of trust. I've stood on this mountain. Three weeks ago, I was standing on this mountain that we read about right here, the place that Abraham was looking at, at the mountain mountains of Moriah, and speaking to his servants, stay here. I've stood there. I saw this place, and as I was standing there, we read this passage of Scripture, and I began to wonder what it would be like if I was standing at the place where I knew I was about to sacrifice my greatest dream and my greatest love. How does somebody do that? I'll tell you how. Look at the last line here. It says, we are going to go, and we are going to come back. Abraham had faith and believed that somehow, some way, his son was coming back with him. Somehow, some way, his son was coming back with him. Now, I don't know, but in the next part of the story, it just shows, it just brings us more. It says, Abraham took the wood of the burnt offering, he laid it on his son. 
And he took in his hand the fire and the knife, and they both went, and both of them went together. Now Isaac said to his father, Father, my father. And he said, Here I am, my son. Isaac said, Behold the fire and, and the wood, but where is the lamb for a burnt offering? And Abraham said, God will provide for himself the lamb for a burnt offering, my son. So they both went together. God will provide the lamb. God will provide the lamb. God will provide the lamb. 2,000 years later, on the same mountain in Israel, the same mountain that Abraham laid his son on the altar, put the wood around him, bound him down with ropes, raised the knife, and was stepping in to plunge his knife into the heart of his son. And God said, wait, wait. On the same mountain, 2,000 years later, Jesus Christ, the only beloved Son of God, was led to a place called Golgotha, was put on a cross, and died for our sins. God provided the Lamb. God provided the Lamb. He asked Abraham to give up everything to see if he was willing to give up everything. But when he saw the willingness, he said, stop, I will take over. You see, God's asking you to give up everything because he's willing to give you everything. God asks you to give up everything and trust him because he has already given you everything that you could ever need. And he's willing to give you everything that your heart could ever desire when your heart gets turned to the right thing. So 2,000 years ago, Jesus is hanging on a cross. He breathes out his last breath. And he dies. The Son of God dies. Darkness is over the face of the earth. An earthquake rumbles, breaking the ground around them. The torn, the veil of the temple is torn in two from top to bottom. And Jesus is dead. And the demons in hell celebrated, and Satan himself looked with triumph and victory, saying, I beat you. I am God. And then... April Fool's. Check out this clip. Colossians 2.15 says that Jesus disarmed the rulers 
and authorities and put them to open shame, triumphing over them in the cross. Jesus made fools of Satan and his demons, triumphing over them in his power by rising from the dead. April fools, Satan. You are wrong. You have been defeated. And your day is coming. This is the greatest April fools in history. And you know what? Jesus wasn't trying to fake anybody out. He wasn't trying to fool anybody. In fact, in Matthew 16, 21, it says, From that time forward, Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem, suffer many things from the elders and chief priests and scribes, be killed, and on the third day, be raised raised from the dead. Jesus had been telling them. This had been written about in Scripture for hundreds, thousands of years. Jesus wasn't trying to fool anybody. Jesus is not trying to fool you. He's not trying to trick you. He's not trying to trick you into following him so he can pull the rug out from under you and be like, oh, see all the the wonderful, horrific things you gave up to follow me? Ha, 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 now I got you. That's not it at all. Jesus wants to save you. He wants to bring you out of darkness and into light. He wants to give you life. He wants to give you something real. He wants to give you substance. He wants to give you something that's just not going to shatter and be left in pieces all over the ground. Some of you are shattered today, and Jesus is offering you life. Jesus is offering you hope and redemption and salvation and peace because Jesus doesn't want you to be broken. James 1.22 says, But be doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. You see, the number one deceiver of our souls is us. Well, you know what? I, I don't really need him. I mean, I can, I can show up to church a couple times a year, or I can say a prayer once in a while, or you know what? When things are really bad, I'll throw out a scripture or something like that. And I mean, it's okay because I'm a good person, right? I'm a good person, so that's enough. I mean, my life continues to fall around, down around me. I keep going around the same mountains. I keep having the same struggles, but I got this. I'm strong enough. I can handle it. Me and God are good. It's a lie. It's a lie. Don't just hear about Jesus. Do something with it. Don't just hear about eternal life. Do something about it. Receive him. Ask him to come in. Have a relationship with him and see if Jesus will not transform you. At the end of this month, April 29th, every single one of you that's here this morning, you should come back that day if you don't come back before, which I hope you do. Because we're going to have a young woman get up and share a testimony here that will blow your mind. She's going to get up and share her empty chair story of how Jesus brought her out of a life that many of you would shudder at and has saved her, and now she's in church every single week serving the Lord because of relationship with Jesus Christ. You see, John 11, Jesus tells us something about himself. In John eleven twenty five, 25, Jesus says, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me Though he die, then he will live. And everyone who leaves, lives and believes in me will never die. Do you believe this? Do you believe it? It's not whether or not I believe it. It's not whether or not your parents believed it or if grandma believed it. Do you believe it? Do you believe that Jesus is the resurrection and the life? If you're getting baptized this morning, you're dismissed. Do you believe that Jesus died on the cross for your sins? Do you believe that you have need of a Savior? Do you believe that you need Jesus? And do you believe that in His power and His glory and His might, God raised Him from the dead? Because Jesus is the great reversal. Jesus is the one that if you are dying, can bring back to life. If you are sick, can heal you. If you are a captive, can set you free. Jesus is the resurrection. And he is the life. 
Would you bow your heads this morning? Some of you desperately, (laughs) desperately this morning need to be put back together by Jesus. But here's the promise. You see, the Bible doesn't say that if you let him, Jesus will take the pieces of your life and he'll try to glue them back together like a four-year-old and you'll, you'll have all these jaded edges and you'll be a mess and nobody will really recognize you from your original form. No, the Bible says that if you put your faith and trust in Jesus, he will make you a new creation. He will remake you, renew you, and give you a whole new life and a whole new chance and a whole new start. I think it's time to let go of the hollow life and grab hold of the resurrection and the life. If that's what you want this morning, would you raise your hand? Would you be just bold this morning and raise your hand? Like, just raise it high? Who cares who can see you? You know what? I don't, I don't buy that. There's more of you here. Keep raising them up. If you want the life that Jesus is offering, the real life, raise your hand up. There's hands going up all over around this place. All right, you can put them down. I'm going to say a prayer. This prayer, the words I'm going to say will not save you, but you meaning these words will save you. These words have to come from your heart, and these words go something like this. You just pray these words from your heart to Jesus. Dear Jesus, I need you to save me. My life is broken, and I need you to make me a new creation. I give you my life. I give you control, all of it right now. Just just take it. I trust you. I I believe in you. I believe in your death and your resurrection. I believe that you love me and I believe that you have a plan for me. I give you my life. In Jesus' name. Now some of you, some of you have gone through the motions. Some of you have come to church this morning to make somebody else happy. But some of you this morning just raised your hand and you just prayed a prayer that if you will allow it, will change your life. It has the power to change your life. But here's the next step. It's not enough just to ask Jesus to save you. Now you've got to allow him to change it. Now you've got to allow him to do something in your life. And the way that you can do that, number one, is after service, please come and find me. Please come and find me and tell me that you prayed that prayer. And number two, you can come Tuesday night at 6.30. Tuesday night at 6.30, right here at this church, we have a class for you to start taking. It's a short class that will tell you all about what it means to live your life for Jesus. Can we give a hand to those who made that decision this morning? the best decision you'll ever make it's the best decision that you'll ever make now we're going to get ready to baptize some folks here now we take baptisms really serious here at Word of Life so what we're going to do is when these folks come up out of the water you're going to stand to your feet and you're going to shout and you're going to clap and you're going to cheer like you're at the Super Bowl because this is better than the Super Bowl but to prepare our hearts for that, we're going to sing that, that song that we sang earlier again. We're going to pump ourselves up, and we're going to give the Lord the praise and the glory that he deserves. Because today is Resurrection Sunday. Today we have been set free. Today, as every day, our Savior lives. Amen? Let's stand to our feet and let's praise his name.
endure it forever. Lord, you are good. Lord, you are good in your mercy. Endure it forever. Lord, you are good in your mercy. Endure it forever.
amazing people. Everybody say, what's up, Avanti? Come on up, buddy. I love this guy right here. He is super excited. Come on in, my friend. You're going to sit down facing that direction. It's nice and warm, isn't it? Yeah, you were afraid it was going to be cold, weren't you? All right. Water baptism is one of the most exciting, most amazing things we get to do in the church. Because every single one of these people that's coming up here are making a public declaration to you that they have chosen Jesus. Amen? All right. All right, brother. Because you have received Jesus as your Lord and Savior, I baptize you in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. All right! Yes! Hey, I love you, man. All right, everybody say, what's up, Amy? What's up, Amy? No, that's okay. All right, you're going to sit down facing this way. Whoops, you okay? All right. So this amazing lady right here showed up with a friend of hers to our uh, New Believers class about six weeks ago, and on her first night, she gave her life to Jesus. All right, Amy, you ready? Because you have made the proclamation to make Jesus Christ your Lord and your Savior, I baptize you in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. All right. Here you go. go. All right. Everybody say, what's up, Jimmy? (laughs) Come on. I met this awesome guy a couple months ago over at Christian Care. Jimmy's an incredible guy. He loves his kids a ton. And uh, he's been going to our uh, growth track class here, and uh, he's decided to, to rededicate and, re- and baptize, get baptized today because he loves following Jesus, don't you, buddy? Yes. All right, Jimmy, because of your confession of faith in Jesus Christ, I baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. All right! sit down and face this way. Now, I'll be honest with you, I'm just getting to know this young lady, but she found out we were doing baptisms, and she said, Jesus is my Savior, I want to get baptized. So we said, okay. You ready? Nevea, because of your confession of faith in Jesus Christ, I baptize you in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. All right. What's up, Ashley? This is an amazing young woman who is also, yeah, you you can tell grandma's not a little, are you grandma? 
Mother's well, it doesn't matter. You everybody, you love everybody. There you go. Ashley, we're so glad you're with us. We're so glad to have you as part of our family. We love you. Not as much as Jesus does, but we love you. Because that you have made that decision to make Jesus your Lord and your Savior, I baptize you in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. You all right? are the greatest decisions anybody can ever make. Today's Easter Sunday. Today is Resurrection Sunday. Today we celebrate the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. Amen? Amen.